My name is Noshin, and uh, my talk today is um, titled Women Workers in Bangladesh's Garment Industry, Class Consciousness, Agency, and Collective Organizing. So for the past few years, I've been studying labor organizing in Bangladesh, uh, specifically within the ready-made garment industry. Um, some of you may or may not know, but in recent years, the industry has been hit by wa waves of riots, strikes, and factory occupations related to demands for fair living wages, compensation for factory disasters, and other benefits by workers. These are the actions, that, actions and events that are typically captured within uh, national and international media, but what's been largely left out is... Um, uh, what's been largely left out of this coverage is the range and forms of organizing that have made these uh, more militant assertions of workers' resistance possible. So that's what drew me to this research. In particular, I became an interested in exploring uh, one, the forms of activism and organizing, if any, that had been occurring in the country. Two, who was taking part in the organizing of, uh, efforts, and three, why this organizing had not received the attention that it would seem to warrant given the importance of the industry uh, to the country and workers' challenge to it. So this is what today's uh, presentation attempts to address, and it's a very, very small piece of a much larger project that um, is geared towards understanding the processes of collective organizing in Bangladesh. In particular, uh, that larger project attempts to understand ongoing processes of class formation and the development of class consciousness, uh, among the most marginalized and exploited section of the global working class, recently pro proletarianized, gendered, and racialized workers. So today I want to discuss two aspects of this larger research. The first is how the global RMG industry, RMG being ready-made garment industry, is changing the demographic composition of the working class in Bangladesh, and to what we might learn from the experiences of women workers and labor activists in the RMG sector and their contributions to the building of an infrastructure of dissent in the country. Before moving on to the discussion itself, a quick note on my methodology. Uh, guided by feminist methodology, my methods of data collection strive to place both as the object and subject of analysis the racialized gendered worker. And for these reasons, my case study draws primarily on qualitative research methods, interviews with key informants and participant, uh, participant observation. This was done over the course of two years, beginning in the summer of 2014, in the greater area of Dhaka, which is the capital city of Bangladesh, where the majority of the country's garment factories, union offices, and worker solidarity organizations are located. Turning then to my first question for today, what is the role of the global RMG industry in changing the demographic composition of the working class in Bangladesh? I've found that the industry has played a foundational role in transforming the demographic composition of both the formal working class in Bangladesh, as well as surplus labor, through its absorption of young, rural, and poor women into the labor force. To understand how poor, racialized women from Bangladesh have become absorbed into global garment production, let us begin with Marx's assertion that the appropriation of, sur of surplus value is directly contingent on the availability of exploitable labor power. As Ferguson and McNally argue, a central feature of the neoliberal, neoliberal era has been the globalization of primitive accumulation, large-scale process of dispossession that on the one hand has swelled the size of global labor reserve, while on the other making it more international than before. As they note, quote, the global working class has grown by at least two-thirds and perhaps doubled across the neoliberal period, from something between 1.5 to 2 billion people reliant on selling their labor power in 1980 to over 3 billion today, with half or more of this number making up the global reserve army. This is a stunning increase in dispossession and proletarianization, and one that has been utterly crucial to the neoliberal organization of the capitalist world economy." End quote. Significantly then, economies of the global south, once seen as peripheral, so Bangladesh being this you know, peripheral state, now plays an important role in the process of capital accumulation. Beginning in the 1980s, the liberalization of the Bangladeshi economy saw mass migration of dispossessed people from the countryside to urban areas. While both men and women were dispossessed and added to the reserve pool of available exploitable labor, it is predominantly women that were absorbed into low-wage export-oriented garment production. Like the home where reproductive labor is typically done by women, 
the type of work women are hired for in garment production are gender specific and allocated on the basis of pres presumed naturalized skill. In the context of garment production, women's labor predominates in sewing and assembly work, which, approximates, uh, which accounts for approximately 80% of labor costs in clothing manufacture. Siddiqui's ethnographic work suggests that this work is widely considered to be the lowest value added work in the industry, and accordingly, those hired for these roles are also paid the least when compared to others uh, working in other areas of production. Moreover, the workforce must embody the skills necessary for garment work, so nimble fingers, quickness, small bodies that make them so-called appear, appear to be naturally suited for this type of work. But most importantly through my research, I found that women uh, workers are perceived by employers to be as, uh, sorry, are perceived by employers as being easily domesticated, so more disciplined and less rebellious, further strengthening the notion of their suitability for garment work in the context of um, export-oriented garment work. The notion of natural skill or being naturally suited for garment work then reduces the price of women's labor by defining their paid work as an extension of the work they would have otherwise have been already doing unpaid in the home. As Collins notes, the unpaid reproductive labor undertaken at home then becomes the basis upon which their labor power is conceived in the factory and is used by employers to construct female wage labor as so-called natural and therefore unskilled. It is this gendered notion of naturalization that effectively legitimizes lowering the price of women's labor and serves as an example of how labor is socially priced a priori, so that its value is commensurate to the socio-spatial location of the worker in relation to men who are hired in the industry. Bangladesh has now positioned itself as the prime destination for cut-make trim work. This is the very basic level of work within the uh, global garment industry. And this is particularly important as China's attractiveness continues to decline in this particular um, aspect. And as such, it's likely that the ready-made garment industry in Bangladesh will continue to be structured and propelled by this predominantly female workforce. That this workforce is comprised predominantly of migrant women who are young, poor, low-skilled, and have low levels of education is interesting, but vitally important for the development of the country. As this demographic is now comprising the majority of the workforce of the country's largest, most labor-intensive, and most profitable export industry. Today, the RMG industry in Bangladesh is worth $19 billion and it employs more than 4 million workers in over 5,000 factories and 80, 80, sorry, over 80% are young women, often recent migrants from the countryside. The arrival of the RMG industry in Bangladesh and the shifting of the developmental trajectory of the Bangladeshi state more generally has been instrumental then in not only transforming the residential, gender, and class composition of rural women, but in doing so, fundamentally transforming the demographic composition of the country's working class. Given the significance of the industry for the Bangladeshi economy, we can then say that there is a necessary and specific dependence of the state on the segmented and gendered domestic uh, labor market, as well as in its regulation and management. Turning now to my second question, what may be gleaned from the experiences of women workers and labor activists in the sector and their contributions to the building of an infrastructure of dissent in the country? The experience of class and the development of class consciousness is powerfully shaped by different social relations of power within which workers are embedded. These relations contribute to uneven patterns of incorporation into political and organizational life and therefore uneven development of class consciousness among workers. In the context of RMG workers in Bangladesh, women workers' gender precludes their participation in, ex in existing workers' organizations and the male-dominated existing labor movement and workers' parties. What also affects their development as workers and therefore their ability to think of them, themselves as such is their experience of migration from rural Bangladesh and their age. My research suggests that class consciousness and subsequent class formation is not spontaneous in that it simply doesn't happen, obviously, from entering wage work. Uh, rather, institutions are crucial for the process of developing consciousness as well as for the process of class formation. Institution, both the level and form vary in the context of what's available and relevant for RMG workers. Um, it includes the intergenerational households of women garment workers consisting of women who work largely from their homes or are employed by the RMG industry at the same time over different periods. 
Developmental NGOs, for example, those that are mandated to deliver women's empowerment projects or other developmental projects. And worker centers, so these include organizations that provide health, legal and family services for workers. Furthermore, they may be formal or informal in nature in that they may operate according to a particular structure or may, inf or may uh, operate more informally without one, for example, through friendship or kinship networks. I found that it's a combination of these different institutions that bring diverse workers in terms of age, ethnicity, religion, sometimes caste, but most particularly gender, together in the same space on the basis of their class and class-based experiences. Workers access these institutions not necessarily to seek out employment advice or explicitly organizing purposes. They access them for a wide range of reasons, such as developing or expanding friendships, uh, other networks, seeking legal support, using daycare facilities for learning and education opportunities, because as low, uh, low paid uh, working class or recent migrants, they, they do not necessarily have access to institutions that provide these services free of charge. To this end, we can see how a broad range of differently mandated, inst mandated institutions can bring working class women together on the basis of their practical or strategic gen gender interests. As Jeffrey Weber notes in a study of left ind indigenous struggles in Bolivia, common experience is necessary both within and outside the workplace, and an infrastructure of class struggle might be thought of as an incubator of that common experience. The coming together of these women allow, to allow them to share their experiences about workplaces as well as other class-based experiences. And it is through their engagement with this wide variety of institutions that women become incubated in the common common um, experiences of working class in, in Taka. Without these institutions, these women would not be exposed to the communities beyond their households and neighborhoods in a city such as Taka, where social norms and mores dictate the extent of young women's exposure uh, to others. In practical terms, workers need a variety of institutions and a broad infrastructure to support and sustain working class dissent and mobilization. As Il Alan Sears has detailed in his recent book, um, an infrastructure of this kind consists of a variety of institutions that collectively work to build the capacity of rank and file workers through critical and popular education, the, pro pro the procurement of physical and virtual spaces, etc. Workers need institutions to build and generate counter hegemonic ideas and strategies to achieve effective communication independent of the state and corporate media, and to archive and share memories and tools and tactics of past struggles. At the national level, this broad in infrastructure of dissent includes institutions that range from the informal networks of workplaces, neighborhoods, and communities to the structured settings of plant-level trade unions, national labor federations, and at the global level, it includes international labor unions and international solidarity activists. As Sears notes, an infrastructure of dissent provides the means for workers to address their fragmentation as well as their diversity in regards to their level of political consciousness, demographic composition, etc., to make sense of their own experiences, both in the past and present, and develop autonomous capacities and a political culture that may be reproduced both in the workplace and in the community. This is crucial for, for collective agency that drives the working class, as well as activist mobilization. The infrastructure of dissent itself is renewed and restructured in response to restructuring or reorganizing of production, as well as social reproduction. In adapting the concept of infrastructure of dissent to formulate the notion of infrastructure of class struggle, Weber argues that all those formal and informal networks in the workplace, community, household, land, and territory that orient, organize, politicize, and mobilize class struggles of the largely indigenous proletarian and, and uh, peasant majority, such that revolutionary memories and popular cultures of resistance and opposition can be sustained and adapted to changing contexts of struggle. This conceptualization is helpful because it shows that class consciousness and class formation cannot be taken out of its practical context within which they occur. For RMG workers, we're sp speaking specifically about very young rural women, and this does have an impact on the ways in which they become conscious of their class-based struggle, specifically through their gender-based identity. This shows that what has largely been considered non-material in the eyes of many actually has infused within it a very material reality. In the context of Bangladesh, whether we call it an infrastructure of dissent or class struggle matters less because the actual level of 
activism in absolute terms is still quite limited. What is more interesting is the ways in which this infrastructure is being put together and by whom, and what it suggests about the development of a new class of working people, the social realities they are embedded in, and how they navigate these struggles. Given that RMG workers organize primarily through informal networks and are relatively new to organizing in formal or official capacity, we can see that institutions such as NGOs and worker centers, as well as informal institutions such as the intergenerational household and working class neighborhoods are key institutions for bringing RMG workers into the fold of organized dissent. And I really welcome uh, the audience to ask me about NGOs specifically because I know that's going to come up. Um, but I, I don't want to go into that right now. Um, these workers often engage in gender-based activism or are brought together on the basis of their gender before they're able to articulate their, their class position. These workers understand the ways in which gender interacts with class to give them the social standing they have both in the workplace and outside in society. They're aware that they are hired for precarious, low-paid work because of their genders and the values associated with womanhood. Their perceived servience, their perceived ability to do unskilled labor of sewing, stitching, trimming, cutting, uh, being diligent, and being, most importantly, being able to work harder than their male counterpart. To this end, my conversations with workers and activists reveal that they understand why it is they that they have to engage in wage labor, despite the fact that it is still socially uncommon or deemed unnecessary for women to work in Bangladesh. Because they can no longer, uh, they're no longer able to subsist via the labor of male family members in their village or city, but in doing so, they have to settle for unskilled work. They're very aware of who is making money off of their labor, although they do not necessarily know where they fit in the broader sort of global supply chain. They, do understand that their work is very gendered and disproportionately benefits factory owners and managers who are predominantly men or upper class women. While not articulated in class terms, they understand this in relational terms, both in terms of gender and in terms of differences between themselves and upper class women. Women workers in the sector do not yet think in terms of class because they've only recently been drawn into wage labor compared to men. They're among the first and second generation of women workers in the formal labor market. This is in large part why women in the RMG uh, sector do not yet articulate or see themselves as a class yet. They see themselves and are seen by others in society as temporary workers. Those who will perform garment production until they are married, until they have children, or have secured sufficient resources to address the shortage that they are facing. This lack of permanency makes it challenging for women to see themselves as a new layer of the working class. And these are, of course, very gendered reasons for why this new layer does not experience class per se. When they do think in terms of their socio socioeconomic location, both in terms of exploitation um, and status in the workplace or in society, they correlate this to their gender and therefore class. It is therefore the boundedness of, of gender to class that allows us to speak of their class experience class consciousness, and ultimately class formation. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Mariana Stoller. I'm from the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid. Uh, and now I'm going to talk about my paper class consciousness, union, and class fraction, brief analysis of the working class in Argentina in the mid-70s. In the context of the international capital crisis, in June and July 1975, workers' conflict took place in Argentina in different factories with demands for economic and working condition improvement and against the direction that the union leadership was taking. In June, after the announcement of strong recessive measures, there was a general mobilization toward the headquarters of the national government that forced the union leadership to take the lead in the protest with the call to a general strike that was massively attended. Behind the mobilizations in the industrial neighborhoods of Buenos Aires were the Coordinadoras Interfabriles that had been established since, last, since, since late 1974 in some regions. 
These coordinadoras arouse from the articulation of the workers' organization by place of work and by zone, breaking the distinctiveness of Argentine Argentine trade unionism to unite the workers of the same branch. Thus, in an attempt to overcome the isolation of the struggle within each factory, metallurgical workers, textiles, teachers, and so on, were united in the same coordinadora and a on a purely territorial basis, trying to dispute the directions of the unions from left and classic positions. The trade union organization in Argentina is centralized, vertical, dependent on the state, with a strong presence in the workplace and an important political power. These characteristics determine the type of action and the organizational forms that the union will adopt as it emerges from the collective bargaining agreements. Also, the vertical and centralized structure imprints strong identities to all unionized workers and for those not affiliated with the union too. On the other hand, in defining the task of each working stratum or rank, workers' identity are partly delimited and a feeling of belonging to a particular union is built. The strong presence of the union in the workplace guarantees the constant generation of union leaders who will join the structure and renew the leadership. But on the other hand, it can also be the charm of the contexting to what is established and negotiated by the trade union leadership. Then, how can we explain the expansion of combative leaderships inside trade unions with a reformist articulation? Um, in order to explain this process in all this complexity, it is necessary to break with, break with two preconcepts. First, with the idea that workers' bases are passive and apathetic entities without the will to decide, immersed in a bourgeois ideology with which they cannot and do not want to break. Second, with the binary conception of syndicalism where the leadership will always respond to the wishes of the bourgeoisie and where the ontological revolutionary workers will be constantly betrayed by their leaders. It is possible to affirm that there is, within Marxism, a tendency to attribute a passive role to the trade union basis. From an initial perspective where Marx and Engels saw in the union an important political potential, to the Leninist concept of a union conscience incapable of overcoming bourgeois ideology, through the collaboration and incorporation of the unions to the system that Trotsky observed, the role of trade unions is controversial within Marxism. Both. Lenin and Trotsky, and many who came after them, have seen from various axes unionism as a barrier to the revolutionary action of the masses, especially to the development of their socialist conscience. They understood that their unifying function of the class was positive, but that the corporate belonging that it generated would not allow by itself to transit for bourgeois ideology. Trotsky, for his part, emphasized the action on the state and the bourgeoisie to co-opt unionism in order to take away all, the, all of its threatening potential. This action was embedded in the role of the union bureaucracy, a leader that no longer belonged to the working class, nor by how it obtained its means of life, neither by its ideology. Thus, the union will be integrated on the one hand by a bureaucratized leadership that to defend the basis of its powers, agree with the state and the bourgeoisie the maintenance of worker protests within certain channels, and on the other hand, by a pathetic workers' basis ideologically under the bourgeois hegemony for being members of that union organization. So what are the limits of trade union consciousness? Is it possible to develop a socialist consciousness among workers through trade union struggles? Although the union is a product of capitalist society, it will be absurd to think that the total assimilation of leadership to the system is possible because each action of the leadership requires, to some extent, a material support of the basis and also because the capitalist relationship is essentially antagonistic, so the integration of workers and hence their organizations into the system cannot be total. Thus, if the material support of the basis is necessary for the actions of the leadership, it will be necessary to analyze the process in which the common interests of the workers' group are built and how they will lead to the constitution of a leadership in charge of concretizing them. 
So in my opinion, the union should not be considered from a monolithic point of view. It is necessary to emphasize that the union is not a homogeneous organization. Inside of it, as inside of the working class, disputes arise on what sense to print to its struggle or on which will be the strategy to adopt. The union as an organization developed by the working class must be thought as a manifestation of its consciousness. But in this sense, there is, a Marxism, there is in Marxism a controversy over how the class should be thought, from a structural point of view or from a social relations one. This controversy can be exemplified by the debate between E.P. Thompson and Perry Anderson. Although the structure given by the development of productive forces determines both individual and their organizations, an analysis focusing just on the structural determination aspects make it impossible to capture the movement that is generating within each mode of production and within of each social formation. In this sense, a fundamental contra contribution of historical materialism as a tool of analysis is the understanding that it, it is the class struggle that marks the rhythm of historical development, and that is precisely in that conflict that the classes will be self-constituted and mutually determinate. Thinking about class as a social relations allow us to visualize class consciousness as something in constant transformation. Determined by class struggle, the passage from class in itself to class for itself is a process where the working class self builds itself out of historical development. It is something difficult to measure since it has very different forms to manifest itself in each historical moment. However, the consciousness of a class is given in the organization and not in the mind. So the praxis or the organization will be a good starting point to analyze how is the position of the class in each moment. Taking into account its total dependence of the relations of force in the class struggle. It is important to emphasize that each organization has an orientation that is also forged by the proletariat. The analysis of the class as a social relations also allow us to observe that cl social classes are not a homogeneous block. Different class divisions coexist with e each other. Then we can affirm the existence of conflicts within the class that depending on the historical context can be openly manifest or remain latent. And if in the process of self-constitution the working class manifests its consciousness in the formation of organization, it is possible to affirm that these differences can be observed within the workers' organizations. Therefore, there are conflicts, whether latent or manifest, within the class and its organizations, on what strategy to adopt and with what methodology to carry it forward, what future or horizon will be possible, how they will relate to the rest of society. Dispute for the self-constitutions as a class, for the construction of identity. This conflict is clearly seen, as I have already said, in the case of trade unions. Like the class, this organization must be seen as a process, thought not from the structural point of view, but from the point of view of relations. What I'm saying is that for every degree of consciousness that has the unionized workers and from each specific material situation that they live, will be erected a specific leadership to represent it. Assuming, however, that the union leadership will always act as a break on the development of a revolutionary consciousness in the workers implies ignoring the extrinsic characteristic of each historical moment and the complexity of the class in each context. In this sense, in order to capture this complexity, I think it is convenient to use the concept of class fraction. In this way, the coexistence of different representations of the world and therefore different strategies to adopt leads to the generation of disputes for the leadership of the trade union movement and shows that this leadership is not something given, but it is in a constant process, not linear, of constitution. Thus, the constitution of this leadership will depend on the relations of force within the trade union movement. However, in turn, it is appropriate to question the origin of the immediate collective interests of workers. The workers develop a corporate identity based on their experience in the trade union collective. It is through their socializing experience within the factory as a collective producer and within the union organization that it will delimit their perception of what their immediate common interests are 
and what the best forms will be to pursue them. Thus, beyond the orientation and achievement of union leader, it is necessary to know what is the perception that the worker bases have of them. In this way, it is necessary to distinguish trade union activity from collective bargaining activity, Negotiations for simple wage improvement within capitalist production relations are only one strategy that the trade unions can follow, but there are others that are possible. Likewise, it is necessary to not identify the trade union activity with the activity of the trade union leadership. If, if we understand trade unionism as a process, all decisions taken are the product of an early dispute. Being able to analyze in each historical context, the dispute within the union, with what material force each class fraction counts, and what are the, ally the ally alliances entered into, to, or to be entered into, will be of paramount importance of the, for the action of the party. In the case of the worker struggle of the mid-75 in Argentina, it will have enabled a more appropriate approach and the construction of a proletarian support strategy. The framework of emergence and growth of the Coordinadoras was the return of Peronism and its program of class reconciliation to the executive branch. With the old crisis, the conciliation of classes was already impossible. The struggle between labor and capital began to leave the official channels as it moved to the workplaces, and the union leadership was subject to a negotiation that no one respected. Some authors see in the days of June and July a, re a revolutionary situation. It is true that within the bourgeoisie there was a strong dispute over hegemony and that class conflict became manifest and evident. However, those who affirm this consider that the union leadership betrayed the movement of revolutionary basis. What these historians do not consider is that the traditional Argentine trade union leadership had many more supporters within the labor movement than detractors. In addition, that the anti-bureaucratic claims of the Cardinadoras did not try to impose an alternative union organization, but using the channels enabled for that purpose, wanted to dispute the leadership within the existing organizations. In their claims, they constitute autonomous organizations with new methodology of struggle and protest that aroused the class fear of the bourgeoisie and unleashed a strong repression on them. But their slogan were not socialists. They did not leave the channels of the Peronist ideology, although they disputed the meaning of that one to the national bourgeoisie that shared the alliance of classes. If many of the Marxist left parties that at that time had learned to read, the workers protest correctly, they will have concentrated their forces in accompanying that sort of incipient rupture with the Peronist ideology that a group of working bases was experimenting instead of labeling their consciousness as embryonic. The way in which the class is fought determines the political approximation that will be made towards it. If class consciousness and praxis are considered to be strongly dependent of forced relationships, Class consciousness will be seen as being in a process of constant construction and the party will accompany the process of self-constitution of the class in class for itself. On the other hand, if we think of class as determined just by a structure, we may run the risk of falling into an analysis where class consciousness is an ideal type, a model, to which the working class must arrive and the party will be play a leading role in being the barrier of that consciousness that for the class will only be acquired and not built. I believe that those who have chosen historical materialism as the most effective mean of analysis of the reality assume the political position that implies that Marxist materialism is not a mere statement. It is a political position. Praxis must have a material foundation. Thus, it is our obligation as Marxist social scientists to account for the contradiction present in reality in order to transform it. If we conceive reality only from a structural point of view, we are only seeing a photograph which tell us, noth which, which tell us nothing about the specificity of, of a certain society and of a certain historical context. We must consider that on the determination of the structure, economic structure, there is a political social structure that may have its contradiction with this structure. What do we do as Marxist analysis, analysts 
if we are not able to reveal these contradictions in order to operate on them. In this sense, the theoretical perspective of the class as a process and relationship seems to me the most correct way for this, considering that the class has to be the author and protagonist of its own emancipation. Thank you. So I guess we'll open it up to questions, feedback. Before. Maybe just introduce yourself and then ask the question. Yeah, um, I'm Kavita and um, I'm a communist activist from India. And um, I've also been, I've been very interested in uh, reading and writing about uh, women garment worker struggles in India. And uh, I've also read Dana Siddiqui's work on Bangladesh. I'm very interested in uh, what uh, you said, uh, Nasheen, about, um, I'd be interested in more details about how uh, they're actually able to f organize and form unions and so on. Um, are they organized in unions? And uh, where are the spaces where they're able to organize? Are they able to organize in the workplace or not? Because in Indian, in the Indian context, uh, in many in Tamil Nadu and Karnataka, for instance, um, what we have seen is that the women workers are basically uh, they they are coming. They're very young workers from rural backgrounds in Tamil Nadu, and they are kept in hostels. They are kept in dormitories, and uh, in the name of protecting them, and uh, in the name of the management being in loco parentis in a way, you know, behaving like parents, they will. Uh, prevent the workers from having mobile phones, from speaking to male workers, from going outside the dormitory at all, except to the factory and back. And so there's so much control on them that uh, even, the, even the possibility in Tamil Nadu of organizing them into unions has been very hard indeed. In Karnataka, there have been struggles. That's the other th South Indian state, Karnataka. There have been struggles of garment workers. But uh, the union organizations have often felt frustrated because the, uh, they're not struggling on a regular basis on the issues of wages or work conditions. So there are these sudden, you know, every few years there's a sudden upsurge of thousands of women on the streets over the issue of provident fund, which is the fund for your, um, you know, which is kept away from your wages for a future date. So uh, when the government tries to change the rules about when you can withdraw those funds, then they erupt in anger and there are these huge protests. So um, it's been very hard to actually achieve a stable organizing among garment workers in India for these reasons. So I'll be really interested in uh, hearing more about the experience from Bangladesh about uh, how women are doing it there. Great. Maybe we'll take a couple of questions and then we'll start answering. Um, hi, um, I'm Tong, um, just a student. Uh, I have a question for you, Nasheen, and also for you, um, Mariana. So the first one to you. It kind of uh, tags along the question that you were asking. I was, I'm, I'm kind of interested in what you said about the lack of permanency, whether that, because you mentioned it in a context where um, they perceive themselves the lack of permanency and therefore that don't perceive themselves or are not, um, um, don't perceive themselves as a class and are not perceived as a class either. So I guess the first question would be, um, does this um, idea of a lack of a permanency correspond to a real lack of permanency? And then the second question, if so, if there is a real lack of permanency, so if uh, women really are married, say, later on, and before they manage to build anything permanent, what, how does it reflect, what, or does it problem, pose a problem to best the organization of institutions or the creation of institutions? So how do you, do they um, perceive continuity as something to um, attain in, um, in their organizing? Um, and this question for you, uh, sorry, Mariana, is um, 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 maybe I wasn't quite attentive enough. I'm not sure what, um, what your attitude on the relation between trade union and the party is. And um, maybe you could elaborate a little on this. And maybe also, um, um, 
So I, mean, I guess if we go back to the Leninist writings on trade unionism, so I guess what Lenin had in mind um, when he says trade unionism was a specific kind of trade union, and um, it, it seemed it seemed to me that if you if you if you want to say that the that the trade union can live up to more than um, than what Lenin perceived back in the 19, early nine, 1900s, then um, um, then then you're basically uh, wait I have to think a little, a little bit um, maybe just give it to that uh, what, what's the relation between trade union and party and um, yeah okay one more question. Hi, I'm David. I'm also a student. Um, I regret to say I don't know much about Bangladesh, but I still have a question. Mm -hmm. And I, I followed the news recently about the so-called Rohingya refugee crisis. And do you think the you've repeatedly stressed the rural and poor backgrounds of many of the textile works or the workers in textile industry? And do this is certainly a feature that they share with the recent arrivals. Okay, right there. Okay, sorry, sorry. Uh, you, have you got got it so far? Sorry. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering whether you think that many of the uh, recent arrivals will also end up in this industry in the medium term or in the long term, and what kind of influence that will have on the um, the general um, up, yeah, yeah general situation in this industry. Will that disrupt? Uh, the formal and informal networks that you talked about, will that um, depress wages even further? Mm -hmm. okay. okay, great. Thank you for the question. I'll, questions. I'll start with Kavita's questions. Um, very glad you asked that. Uh, it's been very, very challenging to organize these women. Um, so trade unions in the RMG sector was ba were banned effectively until 2006. Uh, they're still banned in EPZs. So to organize them, um, workers started to think more creatively. So how can we essentially operate as a union or as much as possible without calling it a union? So Bangladesh is a country full of NGOs. So what a lot of former garment workers actually started to do was establish or register themselves as NGOs, but then provide um, sort of worker trainings in a NGO setting. So I had the opportunity to actually go and sort of witness a lot of these training sessions um, to speak to a lot of the former uh, garment workers who are now the sort of leading f figures of activism in the country. Um, and they said exactly the same thing. It's extremely challenging to organize these women um, because of the lack of permanency. They're not, their contracts you know, can be one month. It can be that they're working from the home. Um, it can be that they are doing it at different, um, different factories, so different plants, on a weekly basis or sometimes a monthly basis. So it's difficult to even keep track of the workers within that particular um, factory. Each factory could have, you know, three to five hundred workers, but all of them are temporary and, you know, doing sort of monthly, weekly work. Um, so what these NGOs started to do is um, essentially offer respite. Um, so they would provide daycare facilities, they would provide uh, legal support or um, have other types of services that women would require as a way to get women into an organizing space. Um, in terms of how they do that, uh, again, there isn't a lot of institutional memory. Uh, there isn't, the lack of presence of trade unions essentially means there's, there's no institutional memory. So how do you then pass on this knowledge of you know, uh, activists from the textile mills, for example, which are, which are obviously very, very powerful in Bangladesh? Um, so they started to organize with other workers from different industries as well, bringing them in. Um, a lot of the ways in which they would do that is through popular games. There's a, for example, there's a game Ludo in, in Bangladesh. They would try to uh, capture what organizing looks like using this particular board game. So that's a very small example of, of the way in which they would do that. Um, a lot of the organizing happens within these uh, sort of worker centers, NGOs, but a lot of the organizing happens in spaces of social reproduction, so in the home. Um, what a lot of these migrant women do is they tend to stay with each other, so they're younger, so they live in a sort of quote-unquote mess situation. So it is like a dormitory, but not 
it's not typically the type that you're uh, suggesting that it's employer paid for. Um, they do rent it out themselves. There are specific worker communities, though, that tend to uh, prop up uh, near the factories. So you'll have 10, 15 women that are living in that same space from either the same factory or different factories. So a lot of the organizing happens in the home, not even on the factory floor. Um, with workers from different factories, not even uh, the same factories. How um, the trade union uh, situation, I guess, looks like, there's a multiplicity of unions, so it's not a very vertical structure where, you know, you have the umbrella organization. <laughs> um, I like to use hands. Uh, you don't have an umbrella organization that then feeds into sort of, uh, you know, a federation which feeds into shop floor, uh, you know, uh, unions, it, it doesn't work like that. So there's multiple or, uh, unions that don't speak to each other, that are constantly competing for membership because their memberships are fluctuating between each other as well, right? Um, so you, you see that a lot. In terms of um, Tong's question about permanency, uh, it is very, very precarious work. So the women I spoke to, um, uh, some of the men too, let me know that by the time you're 40, you're pretty much retired from the work because it's extremely difficult to do it. It really poses um, a lot of physical challenges for them to continue on in their work. So by 40, you're done. You're no longer working. Um, and you typically start when you're, you know, 18, 16 maybe. Um, but again, it's very, very short-term contracts. So between that age until 40, which is the absolute max, you're going from workplace to workplace. Uh, so keeping track of these women is very difficult um, because how would you? It's a massive, massive city. Uh, most of the 5,000 uh, factories are in Taka. There are some in Chittagong, which is in the port area, but it's difficult to keep track of them. So one of the biggest challenges for these organizers is how do we organize with a con continuously fluctu fluctuating and you know mobile group of workers? Um, that need to be trained each time uh, because there's no sort of training the trainer kind of thing happening. And then the last question about um, uh, the Rohingya crisis, they tend to be placed more in refugee camps that are not in the city. Uh, they would not be allowed into the city really. Uh, they're very, very far. Uh, in terms of who's, are, are they gonna be able to come into the garment industry? No. Uh, definitely not going to be allowed to do a lot of uh, formal labor. Um, in terms of how these women predominantly tend to get jobs, it's through these informal contract, um, informal sort of networks. So they have a cousin or an aunt or some kind of neighbor who worked in you know this particular area, so they hear about it and they go in for the job. Uh, unfortunately, the Rohingya population just simply would not have those um, connections at all. I think I've answered all the questions. Okay, thank you for your question. Um, what you told me about that Lenin uh, spoke about a specific trade union, type of trade union, uh, I agree with you. But what I'm trying to say is that we had to think of unionism as something bigger um, there are different kinds of unionism, and there each type of unionism of union have its a specificity and its complexity. Maybe I, I wasn't talking specifically about Lenin, but about the people who follows him after and quoting him makes the analysis of the union unionism. And then uh, about the relationship between the union and the party. A relation that where the party analyzed the complexity of the relations and the struggles that are happening in that particular context of that union. That's what I was meaning. More questions, someone? Okay, I have one for you. 
Uh, you talk about the informal networks that helps building this kind of consciousness of the the class and also how the the conscience of the gender no that these workers had so i want to ask you um the other on the other way no this informal networks and this build building of the conscious give them in the society a different organization not only a classist organization i mean maybe like um neighborhood organization or, or something that make um retrofitting like a cycle so as in do they organize in other areas yes so they can keep meeting um union and the other question is like if they are so building this consciousness about the differences of gender in the work they did they use um strategies to um seize the difference to to their benefit i don't know if you understand maybe explain the last part um they have problems and the laws are are worse for them because of their gender if they use these laws but for her, their benefits if they found any strategy where they can get uh, more uh, benefits from them i don't know how to like a strategy not i, I know that the, the laws are okay i i'll try to answer it so a lot of the activists that i spoke to would talk about very specific strategies that they would use to reach out to workers. So keep in mind, these are women that are coming in knowing that they're only going to be there for a week, so they don't really want to be getting into trouble. They don't want to be losing their work. They don't want to be seen talking to activists that are very, very well known. Um, these factories are also very, uh, very secure workplaces. There is often men uh, that you know police the lines of the assembly line. They literally walk up and down um, those lines. A lot of these activists were talking about, or women were talking about, you know how um, insulting it was that a man would come in wearing shorts. Uh, they didn't want to have to see that, and it, it was a very vulgar thing that this man was doing, walking up and down the line, looking at them, and making them feel very harassed. And a lot of them did speak about sexual harassment, which is rampant in factories. So a lot of the strategies actually they use was to actually build friendships. So very, it sounds um, very like insidious, but to even begin that process of, you know, I work with this woman for 10 hours a day, how do I start to build that relationship of trust? How do I get them to talk to me about, you know, their children or perhaps what they need in their community? Maybe it's, uh, fresh clean water or you know things like that so even that very basic process of building that community is such a huge step it takes years sometimes for the same activists to keep talking to this mobile group of women to even get to that stage and part of the reason why i became interested in this is because in bangladesh you see you know spontaneous sort of eruptions of protests and visible sort of manifestations of anger and uh, riots and, and things like that, and you definitely saw that after the sort of big building collapse, the factory fires, but we forget that things happen in the periods of lull. Uh, so the cycle of contention isn't just there's protests and then nothing happens. What happens in those periods is this act of community building, of educating others, of, of getting to that mobilizing stage, but we don't call that organizing work, largely because that's done by women. It's very similar to the activities of social reproduction, but you're regenerating a new base of activists rather than the regeneration of workers. So to me, that was very interesting because we don't call it that. We don't, it's very mundane, tedious work. It's also seen as manipulative maybe uh, to a lot of people, but it's not. That's basic organizing. And anyone that does organize will tell you that's very hard to do. You're not gonna suddenly go out and you know start working on a campaign for a living wage if you don't fully trust the person you're working with knowing that it's banned. Um, and a lot of these women do work in EPCs and a lot of these NGOs, pseudo NGOs. So on one side of the coin, they're NGOs. So on paper, they are NGOs but actually they're operating as unions and trying to get collective bargaining to start working in, uh, in factories. So perhaps that 
is the type of strategy um, you're asking about. In terms of whether they take uh, what they've learned from this organizing into other aspects of their lives, definitely a lot of them end up you know, either uh, opening up their different uh, worker centers. Um, a lot of them become community leaders within their neighborhood. Um, but again, those types of things require you to become a more public person. And in the context of Bangladesh, it's, it's, it's still seen as a bad thing to go out and you know, be angry and you know, visible uh, is still not considered to be a good behavior. Um, and those things are very much regulated by neighborhoods, uh, by the sort of elders within a community. So for example, one woman recounted to me every time she would come back from you know, a union meeting or sort of a signature drive or you know, things like that, she would be harassed by her landlord who lived right next door. So even basic things like that, why are you out, as she told me, why are you outside of the house? Uh, it's past you know, this and this time, you should, you should not be walking around. Even though she's working, even though she's apparently got bargaining power in the household, even though she's making money for herself and you know, for her whole family, it doesn't matter. She still shouldn't be doing things beyond what is uh, required of her. So a lot of them do move into that kind of uh, work. Um, but again, these are people that are working 10 hour shifts. So it's, it's very challenging for them to come home. A lot of them have children, cook, and yes, they still cook for their husbands, right? So they still do that reproductive work. Um, they don't stop doing it. So it's, it's a lot for them to do. Any other questions? Yeah. Thank you. I have one question regarding the uh, garment workers in, in Bangladesh. Uh, you mentioned then uh, that uh, with 40, you're done. You said you, you're done, you're ready, uh, you, you can't uh, do this work anymore. But, uh, but what, what are these workers doing afterwards? So I, I, would prop, I would think that they will have to work 20 or 30 years from then on. So are there any, um, could you say something about uh, some, let's say, typical trajectories or career patterns afterwards? Are there some kind of networks that, that function as, let's say, bridges to other sectors? or? or uh, do you know something about that? What, 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 what about these workers when they are 45, 50, 55? What are, what are they doing? And, and Any other questions before I answer that? Um, so at 40 is sort of the max age that they go up to. So typically it's not even that. The life expectancy in Bangladesh is also not very high, specifically for uh, women that, that come from poor uh, working class um, sectors of society. Um, so in terms of what types of work they would be channeled to, not a lot. Um, so they typically tend to go into the path of marriage, children, um, you know, reproductive work, reproductive labor. Um, sometimes they may do domestic labor, but again, at a, after a certain age, you are not able to do that. That's very difficult work as well, sort of uh, taking care of the home, sweeping, you know, things like that. So there isn't a lot of opportunities beyond that. Um, Bangladesh also doesn't have or has not invested in auxiliary industries in, in connection to the garment industry. So they're not able to be channeled into another pathway of employment either. So they either, very, very few of them tend to do organizing work beyond uh, their career as um, as garment workers, but for the most part, that's that's the end of their work career. That's it, um, which is very very unfortunate because they tend to, at that point, not still not have enough money to live comfortably. You know, um, but that is the reality. It's at the bottom. Yes, now, sorry. 
Uh, it's a question for Mariana. Uh, Mariana, actually, um, you, you were highlighting um, the notion that classes should be understood in a heterogeneous way, so not to simplify them. And then you propose the relevance of talking about class fractions. At least in my work, I, I'm familiar uh, with the idea of class fractions, but uh, most that I've read about is always connected to the capitalist class. And in most of the times when we talk about capitalist class fractions, they are always defined in, term, in functional terms. So what's the role in the circuit of capital? So if it's production, trade, and finance, or sometimes also uh, in geographical terms, it's more uh, local capital, transnational capital, and, and so on. And a usual criticism of these theories is precisely something that you were hinting at, that uh, the working class is a, a conceptualization of the working class is usually underdeveloped vis-a-vis -vis that of the capitalist class. So I was very interested by what you said about applying a, a fractional view on the working class. But then my question would be, uh, what would be the main cleavages or the main criteria you would use in order to uh, identify uh, class fractions within the working class, for example? Because to me, it's not so easy to see it in functional terms as it would be with capitalist or even in geographical terms, for example. So that would be the question. Thanks. Okay, thank you for your question. Yes, it's really difficult thinking about class fraction in the working class because it is always thought that concept for bourgeoisie. Uh, I think that I don't really, th I had really difficulties to think, like, like you are saying, uh, to determine the, any class fraction from the working class. But I think that it doesn't have to do with the wage, for example, but with the material context of the production or with the characteristics of the organization and of the material reproduction, uh, like the neighborhood, the organization that they had on the, those neighborhoods, if they are working class neighborhood or not. Um, also, uh, the kind of industry that the worker works is not the same thing being in a Metallica um, automotive industry or being in a paper industry or textile industry is not the same thing. It's not the same material experience. Um, and also we have the inconvenience that uh, Inside the same factory, we have divisions about because of the the process of production. Production. So also, I think that it ma we must consider to build the, the notion of class fraction. So it's um, a very um, dynamic conception, <laughs> and I think that that is the importance of thinking about it in a historical perspective, with the dynamism. Uh, it's okay. I don't know how if we have another question. No. Yes. Okay. So we thank you very much for your attention. Um, I don't know. You want to say something? No. Just thank you. Okay. <laughs>